Creek. Everything I'm talking about today comes from Chapter 6 of Michael Arden's book on advanced algebra, which is simply titled Algebra. So, second edition, Chapter 6. So, that's where you can find additional resources, problems, and probably some things that are included in there that I forgot in this lecture. So, essentially, today what we'll be talking about are transformations. So, if we have a plane object, so an object in the plane, which we describe as the Cartesian product of the real set with itself, which means it's an ordered pairing of two real numbers, and we choose to represent that ordered pairing with a coordinate plane like this, with this line representing the magnitude of the first real number, and this line representing the magnitude of the second real number. So, this is R2. Now, what do we mean when we say transformation? Well, every single time we have this plane, we have an object within it, like this, for example. No, that's a little too complicated. Let's say we just have, like, a line segment or we could have a triangle, or anything. But the simplest thing to think about is a singular point right over here. But that's not always what we're going to be dealing with. Now, what are the kinds of transformations that we can apply? Well, first, we can apply a translation. Now, any element of the real plane can be expressed as two numbers in a pairing like this, which means we can also express their position as a vector. That's not very straight. So from now on, I'll be writing the position of everything like this. And of course, we'll also be writing vertical vectors, column vectors, as just horizontal vectors transposed because that's what they are in essence. So, now we know we have translation. So what is translation? Well, essentially, a translation, which we write TA of some vector, which we can call X, this translation is just the coordinates of X, X1, X2, being, sorry, okay. So, we write this as TA as a function of x, x being our position vector, which is just the vector A plus the vector x. What's the vector A? Well, I know. Could be anything we want. And then this operates with normal pair addition, this being A1, A2, x1, x2. And of course, this doesn't necessarily have to be the x, y bases. This can be uh, any basis vectors we want. So this is the first transformation. The second transformation we'll talk about are rotations. Now, rotation is when we take an object in the plane like this, and rotate it around an arbitrary center, but most often the origin, into another position. So, like for example, we can rotate these guys like this, and like this, to show that we've rotated them exactly 90 degrees. So, so how do we express that? Well, most of the time, it's done with a matrix like this. Cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. And this is the rotation matrix. So that means the rotation matrix applied some vector x1, x2 is just equal to this giant matrix times the actual vector. Let's see, this is 2 by 2, so 
a 1 by 2, no, this is 2 by 1. So this would go right next to it, like that. So this is essentially what we mean by this function right here. And then the next transformation we'll talk about is reflection. So we take an arbitrary line, but most often when we don't denote anything, we just mean the x-axis or whatever basis we're using, which we could denote as e0. And we take our object and we essentially reflect it. Now what does that mean? Well, we negate the e0 component. So this goes over here. This goes over here, kind of like if we're looking right into a mirror whose line is the E0 axis. So, like that. So this is a transformation as well. And there are a bunch more transformations, of course. Any matrix, which goes like this, is a transformation. So, why are we only writing down three different classes of transformations? And this one is technically not even a transformation, because it's not expressed as a matrix. Well, these three are very special. Why? Because they're the only isometries. That means they always preserve the distance between two points. Any other matrix that you will find will stretch or squeeze in some way. So, these are always very special. So, now what we'll be talking about is symmetry over isometries. So, some isometries will act on an element of the real plane, uh, an element of the real plane, as if they were never acted on at all. So, for example, if we have the letter uh, X right over here, and we attempted to, or that's not very good of an example. Let's say we had a circle right over here whose center was on the x-axis. If we reflected it over the x-axis, then a reflection of this circle would just be equal back to this circle. And similarly, a translation by the zero vector is also the identity. And even more similar... Oh, and also similarly, a rotation of zero is also equal to the identity. So all of these are equal to the identity. And, for example, if we have something like, huh, I don't know. Ah, gotcha. If we have something like this, this rectangle right here is not going to be symmetric to itself if it gets rotated by 90 degrees, but if it gets rotated by 180 degrees, or pi over 2, <coughs> it'll rotate back to itself. So, these are called symmetries over isometries. So, these are also pretty important. Why? Because there are some very special groups that we can make. Actually, I'll go over here. So we can make some very special groups with these symmetries over isometries. So you'll notice that every regular polygon, for example, this pentagon that I'm drawing right over here, if it's centered at the origin, you'll figure out that over over 360 divided by 5 is 72 degree rotations, this thing is symmetrical to itself. And not only that, if you reflect it over the y-axis, 
it's also symmetrical to itself. So, the dihedral group, N, is dedicated to finding all of the different plane symmetries of any n gon. Now, of course, the simple. Uh, now, of course, the simplest dihedral group is D three. What is that? All the symmetries of this little guy right over here, this triangle. And of course, D one and D two exist, but they're pretty hard for me to visualize, so they're out of the question. So, well, no, they're not that hard to visualize. D1 is just all of the symmetries over a point. So, I mean, basically everything. And D2 is all the symmetries over a line. So, what is that? Well, that's just a reflection and a rotation of 180 degrees. So, that's just a group of two elements and the identity between three. So, but that, or those are the two elements. Uh, those are D1 and D2, but D3 is where things actually start getting interesting. So how many ways can you rotate this thing? Well, you can rotate it by pi over 3. No. You can rotate it by 2 pi over 3, and it'll come back to itself. You can rotate it by 4 pi over 3, and it'll come back to itself. And of course, you can always rotate it by 6 pi over 3, but that's just the identity. <clears throat> so you have a rotation of 2 pi over 3, a rotation of 4 pi over 3, and a rotation of 6 pi over 3, which is just the identity. But let's not forget the reflection. Now these are pretty important as well. <clears throat> we just have the regular reflection over the center, which just brings it back to itself. But we also have a, rota a rotation and then a reflection, and then the other rotation times the reflection. And you might ask, Saborno, are these groups commutative? Because I don't see you writing rho 2 pi over 3 r and r rho 2 pi over 3, and the truth is, these actually aren't the same. But then, why am I not writing these as separate components? Well, it's actually a little bit complicated. But basically, let's say x is a rotation, and y is a reflection. And let's say x is just a rotation by 2 pi over n, which means x to the n is equal to e. And of course, y is just a reflection around the center, which means y squared is just equal to e. So then, what does that mean? Well, that means that we can actually do something pretty clever. We can say x times y, or x to the k times y, is actually equal to y times x to the n minus k, where n is, of course, the n. And I'll prove this more in detail next time. So these are six elements. And a fun pattern that you'll find is for dn, n greater than or equal to 3, the order of dn, the number of elements, is just equal to 2 times n. So that's pretty fun. And now, of course, you can also do a lot more fun things with these dihedral groups. And I can actually demonstrate to you all the elements of the dihedral group 4 right over here. So we have this sheet of paper, which is just an arrow pointing to uh, it looks like it's pointing to my left. No, it's pointing to my left. So it just says this side up, uh, which means, well, this side is up. But now I can rotate it this way, and then I can rotate it this way, and I can rotate it this way. So that's four different elements, right? Before coming back to itself, of course. But then I can reflect it, and I can rotate it this way. And I can rotate it this way, 
and I can rotate it this way before it comes back to itself. And you can check the video recording back and see that none of these eight orientations are the same. But then, suddenly, I can't find any more that will bring it back to itself. And of course, just imagine that this is a square, even though it's an imperfect rectangle. So, that shows you that there are exactly two n different orientations coming from there being four different rotations of this thing, since there were four different sides, and there being, of course, two possible states of reflection. So, there are n different rotations of, for example, uh, an n-gon, but there will always be only two possible states of reflection, which always gives 2n is the amount of elements in the dihedral group. So that's it. Thank you, everybody, for watching.